<laughs> Why do I have a file that's only 10 megabytes? <laughs> <laughs> Um, that's off key. Um, that was awful. That was really terrible. Hey everyone, I'm Ryan. And I'm Steven. This is 60 Cycle Hum, the guitar buying, selling, trading, modding, fixing, breaking, reviewing, playing podcast. Hey Steve. Yeah. Is the pedal bubble going to burst? I hope not because I have 312 <laughs> pedal stonks. That I need to ride that rocket to the moon. We got a question from Matthew O'Dowd and he says, is the pedal market going to collapse it's a golden age for boutique builders at the moment but how long can it really last it's becoming the hipster coffee shop of the guitar world so if there's a pedal bubble how are we defining that what is the pedal bubble because when i think of like a bubble i think of like a real estate bubble where like all houses are overpriced and people just stop buying it because it just becomes ridiculous and then and because everyone stops buying then the the market price crashes on everything right so i i think it's that's what makes this question so hard is because i don't think we're i think this might be more of a bubble in the sense of like there's just a lot of people getting into this space uh, yeah more in the sense of like the tech bubble where there's all of these you know what would, there i think a pet is it was it pets.com was like one of the big, biggest examples of tech bubble where it's like here's a website that exists it doesn't really have a lot going for it, but it's super popular because it's a website. Right, right. And like it, they have all this money to throw at advertising. So everyone's familiar with this brand. Yeah. But like no one's using it sort of thing. Yeah. I think, I don't know, I think the real estate thing is probably a better bubble to compare it to because it's things, it's not. It's not a service that you use. It's a product. Right. It's a it's a product that you purchase mm -hmm. and then try to resell later. Uh, I think in those terms, as far as a bubble, I don't think the vast majority of pedals are overpriced. I don't think that's the bubble. Yeah. I think the supply is the bubble. We do have pedals that are that are significantly overpriced. People doing the speculative, like buying and selling sort of thing. Like, oh, this is going to be rare. I'm going to buy this and try to sell yeah. it for yeah. two thousand on reverb. Because, you know, every, everyone that bought it is just trying to flip it sort of thing. I don't think that's not the vast majority of this business. Mm -hmm. But I think the bubble is just how many companies there are, how many products there are. It's it's we were talking to the reverb guys, the directors of the, of the pedal movie last episode. Mm -hmm. It's like it's impossible to figure out how many pedal companies there are at the moment. Right. And if you try to figure out how many models of pedal there are from each company, the the number is infinite. Like the, by the time you're done counting, like 50 more companies have popped up mm -hmm. and 50 have gone out and it's like it's 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 impossible to measure. So I think that's the bubble in that there's such an oversupply of available product that if the demand dips at all, if people just stop buying as many new pedals, like that's mm -hmm. the that's the bubble that will burst. Gotcha. Okay. Um, I think from that framework, yeah. I mean, I, I think at some point there will be too many companies. From mm -hmm. like the idea that you can't count them, we probably already have too many companies. Right. And also uh, like this stuff doesn't go bad. Like, the resale market is huge. Yeah. So at one, what what point is there full saturation where it's like there's too many pedals, there's not enough buyers, right? You but know. I think the other side of that is, um, are you know can there be too many companies? It, it all depends on like, are you doing this for your livelihood, right? Or are you doing this because it's a thing that you do? If every pedal company only makes a dozen pedals a year. Then it's like then the, then the industry can support there being an yeah. infinite amount of pedal yeah. companies because people are buying in such low numbers from each company and it's like a hobby level for most of the mm -hmm. the builders. Mm -hmm. I, and I think what you, where you end up with is you actually have more of a barrier to entry scenario where maybe some of the companies that you think of as being susceptible to bubble aren't actually susceptible to bubble. Mm. So you know your Chase Blisses, your JHSs, your Keeleys, like. 
may be less impacted because they already have such an established fan base. They're too big to fail. Guys, they're too big they're to in, fail. They're in stores. They have a lot of marketing behind them. They have a lot of brand recognition behind them. So I think if there was a, there was like a, a bust of the industry, like they would down, they have to downsize for yeah. sure. A few companies would probably get out of the game altogether mm-hmm. and be like, well, mm-hmm. it's not worth it anymore. Like we've seen that happen. In yep. decades past, various companies go away and then come back and things like that. Um, I don't know. It's it's totally possible that this could all just go away overnight. With, right. Like the invention of a new electronic instrument that everyone wants to play and no one wants mm-hmm. to play guitar anymore. I mean, so to be you know to be fair, I I've known a few. Uh, I say a few. I've I've seen a lot of uh, guitars who are n- are you know now dabbling in. Uh, modular and yeah. synthesizers and rack unit and, and not rack units in this like eighties rack unit sense, but like in the studio rack and the, right. in the your rack or the 500 series style stuff. Um, so, you know, there, there's a question of like, do you really want the modular like reroute? Like, cause the upside is you can route that stuff on the fly, but it's like, that makes it really convenient in our current COVID space. Uh, but you can't like, then if you really want to use it like really effectively, like are you, do you need to learn MIDI? Is MIDI hard? I don't know. Yeah. I I don't think that's the sort of thing that's going to displace guitar equipment. Like it has to be a cultural shift, like the, the same way, like there was a cultural shift from country music to rock and roll. Right. But I think that, I think there is a cultural shift there where it's, people who are currently using pedals saying, I want to use this other thing now right? for this other usage. So it's just kind of supplanting it. I don't think the rise in popularity is there necessarily enough to like fully supplant it. Uh, but I think it's something that you have to at least be like aware of. Yeah. And, um, I, you know, you have to know it's kind of happening and it's where like, I think I know JHS delve into, I think the 500 series stuff, and I I want to say Earthquaker has. I know Strymon had one. At Game least. Game Changer has done uh, your rack versions yeah. of a bunch of their stuff. So I mean, some of these companies are already at least thinking about that space a little bit. Um, but I, but I think from the small company, per, like the really small company perspective, again, it comes down to like reaching a point where it's just not worth it to do it anymore, mm. and. You know, if you're a hobbyist who's only making like maybe you do a run of a hundred pedals and you're done and you're just doing it for fun and, you know, to make like 20 bucks a pedal on the side because it's a hobby or whatever, like at some point you just make less, but it's still your hobby. You just keep making yeah. them. You there's know, a down- you're not relying on that money. There's a downside for the consumer if the industry crashes and there's way less new pedals being made because if it goes to a if it goes to a situation where it's only small builders that are just surviving as a hobby level and then the big builders can't be sustained anymore what you lose is r&d time and and what you're left with is people who are doing it as a hobby when they have time producing small numbers so they're not going to delve into huge amounts of R and D to come up mm-hmm. with innovative, really out there, like pushing boundaries type products are going to be like, Oh, here's, it'll be like the start of the, uh, the, the current boutique trend in pedals. It'd be like, Oh, here's a big muff with a, a switch on it. Cause I tweaked something right. Like that will be the pedal uh, market versus what we kind of have now where it's like, Oh, here's a fuzz circuit and then I've connected in, you know, piles of oscillators and MIDI control and, you know, tap tempos for some reason on a fuzz. Like the inventiveness, the R&D, the experimentation side of it will suffer in mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. situation. But on the other side of it, there's been so much. There's been so many products been produced. Like I, I fully believe like all music instrument production like guitars, amps, pedals, all that could shut down today and we wouldn't run out of this stuff right. in our lifetime. There's right. so much to explore. Like so many of us have multiple guitars. I don't want to use my stuff back here as an example because this is my job. I have this stuff to yeah. make videos. But, but, mo- but most, even before we were doing like, yeah. Before, most even people before have, this, 
most people who like our, our viewers are like into what we do, like people that we see on, on Facebook and whatnot. Yeah. They have multiple guitars. Yeah. They have, th- you know, three or four. That's not unusual yeah. at all. I think I had a dozen pedals before we even started, you know, my original pedal board back from, right. you know, 2005 or whatever. Totally. Like we all have more stuff than we actually need. Yeah. And there's even more of it out on the market every day. Mm -hmm. And if it all just stopped being produced, the stuff doesn't go bad. If you take care of it, it's going to be on the market forever. I think prices would go up if all production stopped overnight. Yeah. Because it'd be like, oh, you have to actually want this. There's limited supply. And so prices are just going to go up. And the people who have it would have to give it up. But there wouldn't be a shortage. I think it, it... Outside of people hoarding things, I don't think there would be a shortage of musical instruments for a long right. t- for a long time. Right. I, I kind of see what you're saying. I, I think, you know, thinking about the bubble and the idea of like a bubble burst, I, I think we could have industry disruption. And I don't know that I call it like an industry burst, like a bubble burst as much as just a shift. A paradigm shift. Um, and I think what would what would have to happen in order to facilitate that is um, more is what I I guess I would say like, and maybe this is short sighted and maybe these pedals exist. They probably, if they do, I'm not aware of them um, would be uh, the influence of foreign markets. Uh, You said that in a scary way. I know I'm scared, Steve. But just so you think about like all your affordable board stuff and how right, many of right. your affordable board pedals are all, you know, it's a, it's a mini delay. That's five different brands rehousing the same mini delay or yeah. the same overdrive The, pr- the or problem with a lot of that import stuff is none of it is inventive. Yeah. And it's all, it's all just like, oh, you want a muff? Here's a muff. You want a, a tap delay? Here's our attempt at a tap delay, you yeah. know? And so what I don't know is what's preventing um, the... Oh, and I don't want to single out China, but it is China right now. Mm-hmm. Um, the overseas manufacturer of like, where's the where is the Chinese Keeley pedals? Where's the Chinese? Right. Uh, where's whatever, the brand? Where's right? the, 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 Chinese the Chinese produced the Chi- Chinese Chase Bliss? Where are the import produced uh, pedals that are made by someone who is doing it because they want to get inventive and creative? Yeah. And push boundaries. The, the vast majority of what you're getting out of China and these these uh, import pedals is stuff that's just trying to f- fill a role with classic sounds. Like right. you're not getting a lot of invention. Maybe I'm, we're wrong. If anyone out there knows of like a Chinese brand that is pushing boundaries, let us know for well, sure. And and maybe the other side of that is you know we have seen this to some extent with the. Uh, with some like Japanese manufacturers over time, you know, it's the same thing where it was kind of like a faceless, like maybe kind of faceless, like the Ibanez and the Maxon stuff from like the seventies, early eighties, or even now, like, you know, the stuff, the pedals that Venerum puts out are extremely expensive. Mm -hmm. Um, But at the time, or, you know, in the, in the history, like the old Ibanez stuff, again, it was, some of it was kind of weird and some of it was, whatever, but like the, the Maxon Ibanez tube screamer. And even I, you know, we're talking about like, what about like the juggernaut that is boss, right? right? You know, you, you have these kind of things that happen. And, and like I said, I just, well, you can look I at, could, Bo- you can look at boss and, and take their business as like a sign that you don't really have to worry about the bubble bursting as far as like mass production, because they've produced literally like, a billion metal zones. Right. And people are still buying them new. Like there, yeah. there are enough metal zones on the planet that no one needs to buy them new, but the people are still buying them new. Right. But you think about like boss, boss inhabits a like an in-between space. And so I guess, again, what I'm thinking about trying to think about is like what happens when the the Chinese version of whatever American brand or of whatever boutique brand comes out. And so it's somebody who's like hand making or at least hand inspecting hundreds of pedals um, at high, high end quality builds, uh-huh. but like 
now you can get something. I'm not saying like the the Chinese Chase Bliss, but something that is innovative in that same way. Something that you can only get right from this brand. What I want, what I want to see is like the Chinese Zvex. Yeah, yeah. I want to maybe like, want maybe a better example. I want a Chinese company to come out and be like, you know what? Screw all these American fuzzes or you know all these European fuzzes that are already established. We came up with our own interpretation of what mm-hmm. we think a fuzz mm-hmm. should be. And here, now we're ready to sell it. I, there might be like Chinese boutique pedal companies that yeah. we just don't know about yeah. because they're not trying to sell to us. All we're seeing is the import stuff that's being pushed out of, you know, AliExpress and stuff like yeah. that or Amazon. There might be homebrew companies over there, like people getting onto, you know, their VPNs <laughs> on their browsers and finding the same resources that people find here, like the downloading PDFs of Wampler's book or whatever, and learning how to build pedals creatively. Yeah. And that scene might exist over there right now and be growing like grassroots. We don't know. I think in the import market, you are starting to see at least some, uh, guitar enthusiasts overseas that are making, right. Uh, at least like, they're, you know, they might be making clones, but at least they're doing like the tra- like traditional builds. Like they're right. not just mass producing in a factory. They're actually doing like hand build, hand soldered, whatever uh, stuff. Like I think you're seeing some of that, but right now, at least what I've seen is limited. It's still limited to clones, but then you, you know, again, right. it's the whole discussion about like. I don't even really care about mass produced versus hand produced and stuff like that. What I'm looking for is the love. Right. You know, I want to, I want to, I want to see a product come out of China that is like, this is a passion pedal. Like someone came up with like their own interpretation Mm -hmm. of Mm -hmm. a sound. They did something inventive. They, you know, that's so much of what like the boutique side is here Mm -hmm. is Mm -hmm. people like I made something. Most people are going to hate it, but I love it. And I think people will buy it and right. like scratching those you niches. Want that, you want that personality instead of like, oh, people like tube screamers. Here's a tube screamer. Yeah. Oh, or like sometimes the, the most inventive you get is like, oh, people like tube screamers. Here's a tube screamer uh, clone that has three common tube screamer mods yeah. built into it. And you know you what? Know? The, and, and I say that that's what it would take something like that to to create a bubble burst scenario but it also could just create an arms race mm. which i think would be a lot more interesting well, i think that's where we have been now uh, i it, think we're i think we're in a yeah we are i think we are in an arms race it is an, it is set, an arms set. race situation in the pedal market right now where it's like it when when we first started doing this podcast mm-hmm. and the years leading up to that it was like all these modders, like even like JHS back then, it was like, send in your two streamer. I'll do my mod yeah. on it. And it was like all this, like much more basic stuff. Now it's like, who's going to come out with a two streamer that's so radically different that it's not even a two streamer mm-hmm. anymore. And it has MIDI for some reason. It has like all this <laughs> stuff going on. It's an arms race to be as different and as expressive and unique and have like the, like the craziest art or the most tasteful mm-hmm. art. Like it is, it is this highly competitive, very like unique situation. Yeah. And I think, I mean, any, any aspect of this could be a bubble. Like people could just decide, I don't really care like about art anymore. And so now all the pedals that are their unique selling proposition is the artwork on them. No one cares anymore. No, I don't really care about like MIDI anymore. Now all the MIDI pedals are gone. I don't really care about, you know, hyper tweakability and mods and stuff like that. Now all that stuff is gone, you know? Uh, So I think we could see miniature concept bubbles burst within this industry. It was like, oh, no one really cares about germanium anymore so we're you know or there's not available geraniums anymore. are pretty right <laughs> like there's i've been hearing a lot of people say like these components are disappearing they've been disappearing for years they're not being made yeah in the numbers that we need anymore so we could see a bubble burst where it's like oh you're just not going to see this style of pedal being made as an analog pedal ever again i don't even think that would create a that would just create its own bubble that's true too. Because now all of a sudden everything that has that component 
Um, <laughs> you think we'll ever hit a more? We'll ever hit a place where yeah, all these bubbles. all these uh, geranium uh, <laughs> fuzzes that have ever been made, like if you want to build a new germanium fuzz, you have to go out and buy old ones and scalp the parts out. Of them. I mean, just, and it becomes so, it becomes like a recycling thing. Like, hey, let us buy back your fuzz petals. We need to scalp oh parts out of it to some extent. I mean, that's there are. Uh, you think about well, they, I mean, this is with cases, but you think about um, Btronics mm. and the whole thing where they're taking like. T- t- parts for their cases off of like old airplanes and stuff. Right. Right there. I'm sure there are people I've tried to do it and uh, you know, I did not launch my, I tried to launch my own pedal company off this model. No, not really. But, um, but I have like had, uh, old equipment from one of the jobs that I had where they were like, we're going to throw this away. And I opened it up like, there's a lot of components in here. Mm -hmm. I wonder if there's anything that I could like use and take it home and like stare at it for a couple hours and then go, I don't want to figure this out. Right, right. <laughs> also, there's, you know, with all the, the import manufacturers and stuff that we were talking about, they're using components that are completely different than what mm-hmm, boutique mm-hmm. builders are doing. They're doing micro SMD stuff. They're not using the classic, you know, like bigger piece, you know, components. Right, through hole. Through hole stuff. They're, so it's like if the bigger companies aren't supporting the manufacturer of what the smaller companies need, we could see a burst, a bust of the, um, of the boutique builders who just, they can't find those parts anymore right. because there's no other industry on the planet that requires the use of these, these big old resistors, yeah. these big yeah. old, you know, but, I mean, you do see a lot of, uh, a lot of, at least like, traditional boutique which i guess isn't really boutique anymore right uh shifting to smd so well that's yeah but the, like you just said it's not boutique anymore like yeah. boutique is like you think uh, but i don't i hate to get into like what is boutique yeah conversation and i think again. that's probably the problem but it's like a boutique is like you go down to your local dress shop it's mm-hmm. a dress mm-hmm. boutique like the person working there measures you and then they make a dress to fit you right uh, or like a tuxedo or a shirt or whatever. Mm-hmm. That's not what most of these companies are. Most of them are making uh, higher end or very taste specific pedals, but that doesn't mean they're boutique anymore. Like if you find yeah. like, where is it? Like this is a boutique pedal. Right. It's made right. in such low numbers and like in super low runs and it's so quirky and unique mm-hmm. that it's like, you can't, you can't go to the store and buy one of these. You have to wait yeah. till he makes 10 more, mm-hmm. you know, that. So I don't know. Tell us why we're wrong in the comments. Tell us what, just what you think. Are we, are we headed for a bubble? And, and you know, I think it's easy to say, well, sell, the, sell, sell, sell all your yeah. tube screamers right now. The bubble's bursting. I think it's easy. It's actually easier to say that, we are headed for a bubble. Uh, it's an easy thing to say when you look at how big the market is and how many brands there are. But I think the bigger question isn't, uh, are we are we in a are we headed for a burst? Or whatever. I think the bigger question is, if you think we're in a bubble, what like why? Sure. Why? You know yeah. what? What's the? Well, I think that's the harder part to think about. Totally. Where yeah. We just hit a point where. Uh, there will not be enough guitarists to support this, you know. Um, and or if we just one day wake up and like, I've already, I've got enough stuff. Yeah. Like if we all slow down, like not even stop buying stuff, but if we all slowed down on buying stuff, like cut it in half, how much we're buying, it right. would affect the industry in a huge way. Yeah. Like that's a bubble bursting right there. It doesn't have to be this hard turn off the faucet. Everyone just stopped. Like if it slows down. Fifty percent, twenty percent, five percent, like that affects the industry in a huge way. Yeah. So I don't. It, I think we will definitely see a period of time in our lifetime when this stuff is not selling as much, and we do see a bubble burst. I don't know if it'll be dramatic. I don't know how long it'll take. I don't know if it'll ruin lives, you know, sort of thing. But yeah, absolutely. I think we're at a high point right now. It's hard to imagine it getting even higher. So there's going to be mm-hmm. low points. 
Anyways, <laughs> let's get into an ad. Yeah. Is that what we do yeah, next? Yeah, this is what we do next. This was sent to us by Elijah Snyder. It is a cat guitar. Yeah. Custom cat themed guitar made for John the Cat Gatto, the guitarist of the Good Rats. That's so redundant. Call me John the Cat Gatto. Yeah. I've been a fan of the Good Rats. John forever. the Cat the Cat? <laughs> Uh, I first saw John play one of these in Rochester, New York in 1978. You can find pictures of him using them uh, on the Live at Last album. I purchased this guitar from Rumble Seat Music back at their first storefront in 1999 in Ithaca, New York. Told me that it had been brought in by a former roadie of the band. If you're a good rat, I don't even know who the good rats are. Yeah, is either. that a band we should know? No, I don't think so. Uh, you know what a rare find this is. Replace the original Grover tuners with Grover locking tuners. I'll include the originals if you want them. Also replace the original Mighty Might pickups with Seymour Duncan 59s. Again, I'll include the original. The small switches on the pick guard, blah, blah, blah. Lots of random things. You know what? Let's just talk about... Uh, apparently, there are pictures on the internet of EVH playing one of these guitars because John, the cat gatto, gifted him one. Of course, his had electrical tape stripes. This is uh, the headstock of this... Oh my gosh, that looks awful. Yeah, the, the 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 clear finish on the side of the fretboard. Um, this is a guitar. The headstock says the cat. There, this is a three-headed cat. There are three cat heads on this. Okay, the headstock is a cat head. The truss rod cover is a cat head. And there's a cat head on the body. In the upper arm of the body. There's actually the pictures head. on the internet of this guy playing his cat guitar. So this is someone that we. Should. He's notable enough that there's documentation of him on the internet. We've just never heard of him. This might be the very guitar in this picture. That that might be Van Halen. It looks like it looks like Van Halen. Uh, yeah, that's what, I, it, yeah, it is because it's got the stripes on it. That, that uh, and somebody mentioned you know, I I saw on your the thing you're looking at that Johnny Bean, who I believe is some sort of metal historian. Uh, talked about this so apparently this is just a band that we should know about and we don't because we're yeah now this is an article from sports talks 1240 mlb hall of fame john gatto from the good rats again i have never heard of this. why is there a baseball article about this i don't know (laughs) you should know steve you should know why there's a baseball connection they're a rock band they have art they're from Long Island. They're best known on at, in Long Island and some other places. I'm gonna say what what I think this guitar is fun. What do you think about it? I think this guitar makes your tongue go mouth. Meow. The, I'm gonna say this is the best cat themed guitar I've seen all day. This is probably the best cat themed guitar I've ever seen. I would, I, yeah, I'd get behind that. And you can, I think it's really fun that it is actually well loved and well played. And it has, it has story behind it. Mm -hmm. Like apparently Mm -hmm. this guy is a known guy and this is his signature instrument. And it's seen plenty of love on the road. You can tell that this guitar has been loved and played well. Like it has all the hallmarks of a guitar that has seen a lot of time being played, which makes me think that, you know, it's going to be a fun guitar to play because it was fun enough to keep playing. Yeah, I'm reading about this band. Apparently they're just like super popular in the New York area and they ha- have had some like famous other members um, and they've just been around for a long, long time. So... I don't know. Tell us why we should know about who this band is and why we're idiots for not knowing anything about them. <laughs> it's fine. It's, it's, Steve, it's fine. We let's don't just, have to know everything about every band. Let's just look at this freaking cat. Okay, I, so let's just, I really like this body I want to just I want to describe it for the audio listeners. So imagine like a, you know, there's the Explorer shape. Mm-hmm. And then there's the star-shaped guitars, which mm-hmm. are a variation of the Explorer, but it has a lot of wood taken out of that back fin. Mm-hmm. This is like, it starts off as an Explorer shape. But that back fin is cut in a way into a star shape where it's a leg and a tail. Yeah. And then where would be the 
where would be like the the top horn on a guitar that you don't usually have on an explorer is a cat head shape yeah so it actually does a really great job of not only looking like a cat but also looking like a guitar like a like a cat like a passing glance at this you might not even pick up at first like oh that's a cat themed guitar like you see this guy playing on a stage and it might not immediately register but then you sit there and you think about it and you're like oh that's a cat yeah i didn't process that at first um you kind of, we kind of mentioned it earlier the the finish on the neck there's like something it weird looks going on gloopy and thick um but you know i don't want to say the price on this is right i didn't even look at the price what do they want for it $750. I feel like that's really low. I I feel like the price of this guitar is right is in if the ballpark. F- it might be a little I actually feel like it's maybe a little high, but If you're a fan of this guy whoever he is, apparently enough people know him that he there's documentation of him all over the yeah. internet and he was able to give one of these guitars to Van Halen. Mm-hmm. I feel like that price is low. 750 for a cat guitar that's like the signature guitar of this guy. You know what this ad needs though. If you're in a cat themed band, I don't know. I'm assuming this guitar plays well because of how well it's been played. Uh, I'm going to say 750 bucks. You go for it. You got a cat themed band. You need this guitar. I think this needs more cat puns in the description. Uh, You know, that someone needs to talk about how if you don't uh, have cat puns ready right now, see if you're failing it. I think I think there at least needs to be plug this in and listen to that like listen to this these pickups just purr. You know. The the, the tone from this guitar is the cat's meow. <laughs> Some pickups are hot, but these pickups are in heat. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> You deserve that. See, yeah. you had that coming. <laughs> the high tones on this will just like will just bite and give you rabies. You looking for a guitar that'll give you real cat scratch fever? Yeah, yeah. Bam, bam, bam. <laughs> That's smoke on the water. It's cat scratch. Which one's cat scratch fever? Probably pretty similar to smoke it's, on the water. It's like it's it's a similar riff. Uh. I I'm out of I'm out of cat puns. I didn't have a lot of them. I just wanted to see a couple. I guys in the comments right now. Cat puns for this guitar. Lay them on us. What's new, Steve? I don't know, man. What's new is we're supposed to be doing a sponsor spot. All right, right do now. the sponsor uh, spot. This episode is brought to you by Big Ear Pedals. Pedals, pedals, pedals. pedals. That's right, Grant and Karen over there in Nashville, Tennessee, are making some of the coolest pedals you've ever seen in your life. They've got the L, which is like a slightly modulated, modern, kind of like always on reverb. The L mm-hmm. is a great reverb. Mm-hmm. They've got pedals like the Loaf, which is a fuzz that kind of leans into like a softer side of fuzz. Like you want like a soft, fuzzy, fluffy fuzz that does like an overdrive sort of thing well. It takes low instruments, really great basses, baritones, seven strings, stuff like that. I recommend yeah. the loaf for that. They have all sorts of the woodcutter, one of the best sanding rats out there. Mm-hmm. Go check them out. Big ear pedals. Did you mention the Albi? You gotta mention the, the Albi. The Albi. It's the a curated sh- multi-effect. It's really cool. You want to make new wave sounds? You get the Albi and it'll do it for yep. you. Yep. So, Head on over to big ear pedals. Doggone. Yep. So what's new, dude? I don't know, man. I feel, oh, you know what? I will, I'll update on something. Update us, Steve. Um, I've been using that uh, Caroline Somersault on bass. Yeah. I used one of the settings um, that's just in the little manual card, and it's fantastic. I don't think I talked he about this it. before. Pretty sure I didn't talk about this before, so I'm talking about it now. I really like it. It sounds great. It's like just makes like, again, it's just the card sound. I haven't even really explored like the crazier stuff because I've been using it with bass, but it's like a perfect like really great 3d bass sound which cool. is what you want out of a bass course. you want that three-dimensional bass mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. what's new with you man um i'm starting a f- refinishing journey for my supersonic <laughs> oh yeah i saw you uh posted uh on this on um i posted Instagram, around Instagram, and did you post it on tiktok i did post it on tiktok and youtube stories and stuff like that i i took the supersonic all the way apart by the time this video publishes i've probably already made 
further moves yeah. on this. Yeah. I have a few ideas in mind. My gut thing that I want to do is take it down to wood and then do like the paint pen thing that I did on the bullet Mustang mm-hmm. because my thinking is like the most desirable version of a supersonic is the heavy metal flake. Right. But if I try to do that, then I'm just doing what's already existed in the past. There haven't been any flat wood, like stripped down rat rod versions of a supersonic that I've been able to find. So I kind of want to explore that space with it. But I also kind of want, because it's still clean with fresh paint on it, with clean paint without scratches and dings and dents, I kind of also want to try just refinishing over it and trying to do mm. something really slick too. I've got all those um, those candy tent spray cans that I have, the, uh, the Edroth Rattle Bombs. Yeah. I could spray this with a top coat of something metallic and then spray candy paint over it. Oh no. And then do the glitter thing. But like that will be a whole journey of like trying to get it perfect. Right. I'm talking myself into it right now. I want, I think I want, I think I want to strip it down to wood. I think I'm going to strip it down to wood. But then also I'm thinking like if I'm going to, if I should just, while it's clean right now, I should experiment with spraying over it. With a glossier look. I'm, I'm having a tough time deciding what I'm going to do. Which direction I'm going to go. I'm so thrown off at the the routing on this guitar. is so weird. It's really weird. Everything about and this guitar is weird. The neck. This neck plate. <laughs> yeah. Well, have you seen the neck heel? No. I guess not. Look at the ass end of this neck. I don't, I mean, it just seems like a normal. But it has this weird neck. little ledge here. Is that not normal? That's not normal at all. Like the way it fits into the body is totally different from any other Fender guitar that I've encountered. Oh, yeah. With that weird yeah, little ledge It's there. got like a little extra space there. And then, of course, you know, the screws on the back are all. Uh, yeah, they're all they're like a, offset. It's a parallel. Stuff. It's a, not a trapezoid. It's like a trapezoid shape. That's weird. It's man. just a weird guitar, but I'm, I'm excited to modify it and make it more my own. I'm also going to put a new bridge on it yeah. because the stock bridge, like the arm fits in it. Not it's not snug mm-hmm. and it kind of wobbles before you get any play off of it. Oh, that, okay. That's been bothering me. Yeah, that's cool. That'll be a fun little journey for, you know, at least a few months here, right? <laughs> yeah, it'll probably take way too long and then I'll not like it when I'm done. <laughs> You'll wish it would it was still blue. Yeah. Just leave it that I saw a lot of people are like just leave it alone, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's honestly my least favorite color for a guitar is that, is that light blue? misty blue. Mm. So I kind of bought it knowing like, oh, I like this slightly better than the gray one. Well, I didn't buy the gray one because when I bought it, the, the set was painted gray and it would have just disappeared. Oh, yeah. Yeah. If I had known I was going to paint the set blue, I probably would have <laughs> bought the gray one. <laughs> That's funny. Next up is an ad sent to us by Nick Scott. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is for an Epiphone Les Paul thing. It's got aftermarket parts on it. It has every single aftermarket part that is skull themed on it. <laughs> Which honestly, like, if you're gonna get into one, if you're gonna get into this look, you might as well go all the way, I guess, because like these sorts of things always look out of place when you just do one of them. I hate that I know this guy, but it's also just so stupid and ugly. <laughs> this is a white Epiphone Les Paul. You it's, know the guy who owns this guitar? No, I, I'm saying like, okay, you keep going through. You got Skull. So all the tuners, uh, I'm assuming the tuners weren't actually replaced. It was just like the the the, the, the tips. The tips. Is that, I forgot what those are called. The pegs. The pe- yeah. Um, they have the, uh, they've all been, re- the knob. The, yeah, the knob replaced with uh with skulls the truss rod cover is double skulls and flames <laughs> the 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 tr- treble bass switch is uh or treble and rhythm switch is like a four skull thing the pit guard skulls the humbucker 
Um, the humbucker casings, I guess, aren't skulls. No, the they're the, like the pickup dirt. the pickup rings. Pickup rings. That's why. Yeah, I mean, that's what I mean. They have, have they're from like the same manufacturer of the skull oh, yeah, theme stuff. Yeah. The stop tail has so, a skull with, with bat, bat wings. wings. Like, there's very little on here that's not skull yeah. themed at this point. The control knobs are skulls. The freaking switch, um, not switch. The freaking jack plate is skulls. Oh my god. But here's the thing. All right, Ryan, you keep scrolling. You keep scrolling. What amp is this being played through? <laughs> uh, some kind of Line Six Spider thing. Yep, here. it's the it's the one that's got uh, some extra knobs on it for like some like CD input or something. We got back. You know, we should be careful making fun of this guitar because the guy who owns it has been pumping iron. He's going to yeah. beat us up. He's yeah. got a five pound weight right there. You know there. what music he's playing on this? One hundred percent guaranteed. This is an Avenged Sevenfold. Oh my fan. gosh! <laughs> no way around it. I mean, literally, they have a song called "Bat Country." <laughs> there is no way in hell this guy is not playing Avenged Sevenfold. I honestly on his really guitar. enjoy that it's a white Les Paul. Like I would have, I would have put money that, like, based off our description here, that this would have been a mm, black mm. guitar, or you know, something more dark. But having it on a white Les Paul, it really pops. It pops. What on here? What do you think is the best skull accessory, and which is the worst? Like, which would you which would you get rid of, and which would you keep? Well, the best and worst accessory is that tailpiece. <laughs> it's pretty that bad. Tailpiece is is so dumb. The one that <laughs> the one that I think is like a it could be a nice subtle touch by itself is the truss rod cover. Uh, if you're going to modify anything on a guitar, just go to town on that. Put whatever you want. That's, yeah, I kind of... That's your space for flair. Like, this is yeah. like... This is like, uh, you know, you go to a restaurant, you go to one of these restaurants that says that is flair. Right. And, you know, per, the person has one button and you know that this is a restaurant where, like, they're encouraged to put as many buttons as they can. On right, there. right. So when a person only has one button, you're like... That one button says a lot about that person. When the person has like all of the buttons, you're like, yeah, come on. I don't know anything about you now. Yeah. This is like all skulls. Okay. We get it. You like skulls, but like, yeah, I think if I was going to pick one piece on here to keep like, Hey man, you got to pull it back. Mm -hmm. Too many skulls. I think the pick guard is honestly like, it's you like the pick guard. It's still like cartoony and over the top and not necessary, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it says it all in one piece. The, the rest of it is just kind of clutter. It's a flaming skull with bones around. I think it. legitimately my least favorite piece is the switch ring. Like, I think that is hideous. Yeah. I think if this, you know, what's funny is I think if the switch ring was just two skulls, like up and down, I'd be like, okay, that's, I think that's it, cool. if it was one skull and the switch was like coming out of its mouth or something, oh, that would be rad. Yeah, that would be cool too. Yeah. I'm just saying like the four skulls implies that this is like more of a joystick than a switch and it's mm. not. And that's very disappointing. Well, it's giving like it's comp not, it's giving compass vibes. It's not a D pad. You cannot go in four <laughs> or eight directions. You can only go in two directions. And then, yeah, that stop tail is just so cartoony that it's stupid. <laughs> Honestly, I hate the knobs too. I hate most of this. I I've, hate all of this. I've, those well, the funny thing about the knobs is you can tell that all of the uh, all of the other skulls on this uh look maybe not the tuning tuning pegs, but they least, all look like they're from the same place. They all look like they're from the same place except for the knobs. The except yeah. for those control knobs. That is uh everything else on here is like more of a nickel finish and those are chrome finish. I hate that we can't see any guitar strap in the picture. You know, this guy's got a skull guitar strap. Oh yeah. 100, 100%. <laughs> also, you could have kept going. He, he, we, it, it seems like it's maximum saturation of skulls, but he could have found pickups. They have skulls engraved in them. Yeah. Or he could have paid yeah. someone to acid etch skulls into those pickups. He could have, done some sort of decal of skulls on the actual guitar. Oh, he could have, he could pay someone to do a skull inlay. He could have, uh, he could have locking tuners where, or locking strap locks where like the button. Oh yeah. Strap was a, locks. Was a yeah. Skull. 
I'm also amused that it looks like this is either being played through a boss DS. I think that's a DS. That's a DS1 one for sure. I say it could be like maybe an MD2, but I think that's the wrong shade. Also, there's no skulls on the bridge. I don't know how you would put skulls on the bridge. There's not a lot of real estate on a Tunomatic bridge, but I feel like it's it it wants skulls. Mm. It's like, hey, where's my skulls? Mm-hmm. You know, you no, know, you gotta do like a like it doesn't all have to be skulls. You can bring other bones in. Oh like, yeah. I think you could do like a fibia theme for the <laughs> the tunomatic or like you could do like a spinal thing like mm. if there was like whoever's making the rest of this metal hardware needs to make a bridge that looks like a spine that could be yeah I was, or you could just do like you said like a fib like a fibia or like whatever like a yeah your classic dog bone bridge where it just has like the joints on both ends and then the bridge with a little extra theming this could be pushed into like a fantasy Conan the Barbarian sort of guitar. Mm, it needs some leather. It needs it needs a direction. It, it needs, needs some body oil. Yeah. <laughs> needs long hair. A, ni- a nice tan. Yeah. This is a 300 pound guitar. <laughs> and Ryan. you play it while wearing a loincloth. <laughs> yeah, this is a 300 pound guitar. Uh, I feel like uh, that's heavy. It, well, it, the skulls. You thought the skulls were heavy, but man, yeah. that's a heavy. Okay, no, everyone's sick uh, of our. European money jokes. <laughs> uh, I, you know what? The price is fine. You can reverse all of this if you if you're buying. Yeah, I this. feel like that's that's probably pretty close to going rate. Imagine for being the this guy model of Les Paul that bought this guitar and then threw. This has got to be hundred and fifty dollars worth of aftermarket parts to make it completely <laughs> aftermarket skulls completely sculled out. Do, like do you think they done, have any of the original parts? Like how much? I don't know. Do you think you could hit them up and be like, "Hey, man, uh, if you how well, this much, picture has the original knobs." Yeah. In it. Uh, could you hit them up and be like, "Hey, uh, how much would you want for this guitar without any of the skulls?" <laughs> you take all the skulls off. Well, you're going to be paying for his labor then. Um, <laughs> But like he's gone through this whole process of just tricking it out with as many skulls as he can, and then he gets to the end and he's like, uh, "I'm gonna sell it." <laughs> and it's, it's described as a gorgeous electric guitar. Uh, you know what? Honestly, like a white Les Paul, mm-hmm. it's attractive. It's an attractive yeah. Epiphone here, yeah, especially with all those skulls. But no, the skulls I don't. I do not think are attractive. I think if I bought this local, if I was local to this, and I went and bought it because I wanted a white Les Paul. I would feel inclined to leave like one skull. Like I would change all the tuners, but one and leave like, yeah, that's the skull you would leave. Just one, just one tuner, a, one single skull, like on the high E. All right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to yeah, this uh, the episode next sponsor. Also brought to you by chase bliss audio the digital brain and an analog heart except for the dark world which is a digital brain and a digital heart so the other day chase bliss makes pedals more creative than you are the other day uh i had my sister and a couple of her friends over here because it was her 21st birthday yeah and uh she was showing her friends the room in here all the guitar stuff and then you got robbed <laughs> well they, they, they might have been trying to lead up to that uh her one of her friends was like what's your most expensive pedal I pulled out the Automatone, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the MK2, because, yeah, it absolutely is the most expensive pedal if you were to buy it new. Yeah. And I was like, wait, let me show you why this thing is so expensive. (laughs) I plugged it in. I didn't even play through it. I just plugged it in, and I started going through the presets, and the sliders started going crazy, sliding everywhere, and all of them, my sister included, I was like, whoa, what? That's crazy. They didn't, they don't care about pedals. They don't know anything about pedals. They saw a pedal moving. It blew their mind. Okay, but I think we do need to say that that pedal does sound great because otherwise you're literally pitching a $700 party favor. Like par- <laughs> party, not party, no, favor, party it, trick. It legitimately does sound great. It does this, like it's, it's a build your own dirt pedal. It can be a boost. It can be a preamp. It can do clean things just fine but you can dial in such a wide range of (laughs) overdrive distortion ridiculous fuzzes you can do wah sounds with it all like the eq filtering that you ever wanted to do it is a severely overpowered dirt pedal that looks fantastic it looks like a piece of studio gear 
So yeah, Chase Bliss pedals. Making pedals more creative than you are, making pedals better looking than you are. I mean, I've seen your pictures on Facebook. You can agree with me. It looks better than all of us. <laughs> so anyways, true. support our sponsor. Go click the link. Check them out. Tell them that we sent you. Do you know uh, we got another topic? We sure do. Let me pull it up here. I've got a screen grab of it. Oh, oh I just pulled up my text with my wife. She wanted to know how much ground beef to buy. <laughs> uh, Paul, all, all, the, all of it. Buy all the ground Paul beef. Paul Heinberg asks, what's the first show you want to see when it's finally safe to do stuff again? I love this. I was just thinking the other day that uh, right before COVID hit, like like six months before, I mm-hmm. put it in my head, like, I want to start going to shows again. My kids are going to bed and staying asleep for decent amounts of time. I can go out at night. I can watch some shows. I can come home and I can work the next day. I need to do this. Mm-hmm. And then COVID hit and it, it cut me short. I'd gone and seen like half a dozen shows after I decided to start doing that. I'm super excited to start doing it again. So like I want to uh, go. I want to go to local shows. I want to go to bands that I care about when they come through and stuff. I don't have. I personally don't have one in mind where I'm like, I I need to go see this band. I mean, Local H did post a tour schedule the other day, and ooh. I looked at. They didn't have a San Diego date, but I was like, if they were playing local, I'd go see Local H right now. So instead of being Local H, they are uh, Local SD. <laughs> what? Local San Diego. Instead of being local H, they would be local SD. No, I was going to say, uh, since they're not going to play a local show, they're not local H, they're like distance H. Oh, distance H. There you go. Yeah. Touring H. Yeah, touring. <laughs> what um, about you? Is there a band that you want to go see? We already have tickets. Because uh, we bought tickets. My, my wife bought tickets for my birthday last year uh, to go see um, May, May and... Um, the Juliana theory we're doing like, what I want, year is it? I want to say, well, it was like, the, I want to say like their 15th anniversary yeah. tours for, uh, for, um, emotion is dead for the Juliana theory. Emotion is dead. And for, um, May's the Everglow, I think they were doing like 15th anniversary tours or something, mm. uh, for some album. Uh, it doesn't really matter which one. Um, and so we got tickets for that and then it got canceled and then it got rescheduled and canceled again. So I think now it's scheduled for like, I want to say August or September. So we'll see what happens between now and then. Um, the other one that we're talking about again is Julian Baker. It's coming back to the observatory North park. And so we're kind of toying with the idea of whether or not we want to try to go see her. Mm. Uh, the last time she came, we went back and forth about it for like two or three days. And by the time we committed, it was already sold out. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's on a short list. Otherwise, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to see. There were a few bands that I think were supposed to do farewell tours last year. And I don't know how many of them, uh, are they just been sitting around waiting to say goodbye? Yeah. I, <laughs> like, we want to quit, guys. When are we going to get a chance to actually finally quit? Yeah. I, I, uh, Me Without You was supposed to do their last tour last year. So they were supposed to do, um, I think, the Vesu 15th anniversary tour with Thrice in like the spring, summer. And then they were supposed to do a fall farewell tour. And both of those got postponed. Hmm. So I don't know if they're doing, I know they're playing like, I want to say it's like Furnace Fest in Alabama uh, this year, but I don't know if they're then going to redo their going away tour or what. Um, And I've even seen some artists, I can't think of them offhand, but I've seen it where like a lot of bands were like reinvigorated during COVID. They're like, we were going to hang it up. But uh, after not being able to be a band for six months, we realized how much we still want to be in a band. Basically <laughs> we changed our mind and, uh, and they're staying in the game. So, um, yeah, like I said, we already have tickets and, and we'll see. I don't know how that's going to go because we haven't done, had like the kids do like overnights yeah. in forever. And this shows in LA, I want to say on like a weeknight. So I wonder if my wife would want to go see shows. We could get, my my kids go to bed great and they stay to sleep. They stay asleep great. I could get like a sibling or a babysitter to come over and like hang out and watch TV, and my wife yeah. and I could go see shows. Uh, my kid right now falls asleep at like midnight. Mm. 
does sleep well. She'll sleep from like midnight to 10 a.m. Uh, but does not like we start bedtime at like nine o'clock and she wow. finally like gives like quits at like midnight. So good yeah, time. I'm, I'm excited. I'm, I am looking forward to getting back out. I'm going to get a, my vaccine. I think this next week here. Oh, cool. So yeah, I'm excited to do shows again, go hang out in dirty dive bars, mm-hmm. uh, eat questionable food at one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I, yeah. I'm excited for that. I think it could be a fun thing too when everything's all clear and safe to be able to go out and like, like hang out with people and talk to people and socialize. You know, I miss all that. I miss it. I hope that surf bands go on tour. Oh yeah. Soon. Like, I'm, I, sure, I, I'm sure they will. Like before all someday. this, I went and saw man or Astro man play. I went and saw the surfer jets play. Like I want to do more of that. God. Yeah. Yeah. This, this next ad was uh, sent to us by Greg Straub. It's not even a full ad. It's just a picture that he posted on the Facebook group. Yeah, this is. So we don't know any details. We don't know any information this other is than what we're seeing here. guitar that has a man playing a guitar. <laughs> a person, I guess it's not even necessarily a man, a person playing guitar okay, it, carved into it. It's real. It's describing this is going to be hard. Like you have to look at the pictures. If you're listening to the audio podcast, click the imager link and look at this. It is a highly carved guitar. Very nice carving. Very artistic carving here. Very well executed. But I've often made jokes and made the statement like guitarists don't need to be reminded that they play guitar with like their home decorations yeah. and the things they buy in their life. This is a guitar that reminds you that it's a guitar because it has a guitar carved into it and hands carved into it playing the guitar and an extra headstock carved into it with tuners carved into it. It's just so redundant. <laughs> and it it's very, like I said, it's very well done. But when you think about the concept, like why? Why do you need yeah. why and do the, you need this message carved into a guitar of like, hey, is, guys, remember guitars when you're looking at this guitar that I'm playing with the has a depiction of a guitar being played on it. Well, I, it's Ungo Pachka. What? It means it's too much. It's a hat on a hat. I've never heard. It's that. a Yiddish term. Steve. Okay. Um, I learned it from the Doughboys. Okay. Um, this guitar is almost like you have a carving of this guitar on its on itself. Except I just realized in the neck position of the carving, it's a humbucker. And the real guitar has a single coil pickup. Otherwise, it's like the whole thing is <laughs> itself. Because, like, look at the the, yeah, the guitar that's carved on the guitar has different pickups than the guitar. <laughs> yeah, it's so, and it has different bridge hardware and stuff. I mean, I think the but br- then they share the same controls. I think the bridge hardware is close enough that you could say like that's a that's an artist. Representation. Representation. Okay, yeah, of okay, I get that. I get that. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, clearly one of the pickups is a single coil pickup and the other one is a humbugger. So, right. Uh, but the headstock matches the actual headstock. Like, this is so strange. One feature about this guitar that I'm also confused about is why does it have an XLR out? I want to know about that. Yeah, that's wild. It's got a quarter inch out and an XLR out. Maybe, Maybe this there's has a like a P8 cell here. Yeah. A Paiso. Um, I really like the way, you know, we can we can trash on this thing. There's a lot to hate about this. I want to know what the actual, like, if you got rid of the carving, I want to know what the rest of the guitar looks like because I really like I really the, like, I like the way the pickup set. I like the... We the, can barely see the headstock, but I really like what I'm seeing. The woodwork is, is phenomenal. It yeah. looks, this looks like a very well-carved piece. It's beautiful, but the concept is just so much... <laughs> Like yeah, I would want to. I want to see a guitar from this builder. That's just a guitar. That's not a guitar with this, a guitar carved this on it. This guitar gives me a lot of like, of like high spirit vibes. But it's like if high spirit did the the original. Like basically, if like some uh, woodworker carved. I you wouldn't even call this woodwork. It's like you know, it's artistic carving. Whatever. Right. Wood sculptor called up. Connor and was like, Hey man, look, I want you to build 
one third of a high spirit guitar, but don't finish shaping the body. Like I'll take care. Right, I'll take right. care of that. Like here's all the specifications I need for all of the wood that I need you to leave. So I can, I'll take care of shaping the body. Don't worry about it. Because like that, the, the one piece, it's not even, it's not a one piece bridge per se, but it's kind of a one piece bridge. Like that looks like something that it, like I say, it just gives me high spirit vibes. Uh, yeah, the yeah. pickup rings give me high spirit vibes. Like, it it's th- there's parts of this guitar that are so cool and then this this sculpture thing it's, is so dumb it's so it's done so well that i want to see other stuff from this builder just i want to see a standard guitar from them you know and i'm not i'm not against wood carving at all like i want to see this wood carving on not a guitar like i want to see this yeah i want to see this as an art piece that just like you you put it up on on your house or it's like a centerpiece on your table or something like that, like a vase mm-hmm. or like a bowl or something that's carved to look like that, like a guitar being played. Cause it's honestly really well done. The art is really good. Yeah. It's really weird. <laughs> I don't, I don't understand. <laughs> like I said, Unga so much about this. Tell us about the song. Let's get out of here. Uh, yeah. Well, before we hit this song, Housekeeping. I do want to say, if you want to support the show, head on over to patreon.com. Slash just see cycle hum cast. You'll figure the rest out. I'm whatever You'll, you got it. Uh, this song was sent by Kyle Saloka. He was on uh, the 420 live stream. Oh, nice. Uh, he says, uh, Hey guys, seems you enjoyed my funky little song a while back. So I figured I'd send you another one of my demos. No weed this time. Sorry. I think Ryan inspired me to go a bit nuts with staccato picking on this one. Lead guitars are less Paul Gibson, less Paul uh, rhythm guitar is a semi hollow harmony. Les Paul copy from the seventies which actually mic'd up kind of sounds like an acoustic then blended with the electric signal. Bass is a Rickenbacker 4003. You mean a Rickenbacker, Steve? Uh, a Rockenbacker? A Rocken A Rocken Badger? Badger? <laughs> uh, lots of pedals and outboard gear that I won't get into because let's be honest, nobody cares. I abused the hell out of a Line 6 DL4 in loop mode at some points. Everything is recorded direct. Drums are programmed. Good enough for a demo. Hope you enjoy. It's a link. I click the link. It's loading. It's loading. Oh, it's got. It's, oh, it's going to take forever. If only there was a way to edit this video.
That was great. Yeah, that's fun. It uh, like if I was gonna pair that with like another band to listen to, like you could put that in a, in a uh, in a playlist with like Tripping Daisy or something like that. Mm. Give me that good like kind of like '90s version of psychedelic vibes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bye, everyone. See ya. Stay grounded.